This is the F-111, a fighter bomber that has seen action in Vietnam and in the Persian Gulf. In 1958, the Tactical Air Command, or TAC, the Air Force Division responsible for ground attack and interdiction, slew F-105 Thunder Chiefs. The Thunder Chief was notorious for its mechanical problems and lack of maneuverability. The F-105 was built expressly for long-range strike missions. It could carry nuclear bombs at high speeds to distant Tarsus. But in Vietnam, the F-105 was the best playing TACAD on hand for air combat. The mission requirements of Vietnam was the fuel-guzzling F-105's limited range, necessitated flying at low levels. This made the plane vulnerable to guided missiles. Thunder Chief was restricted to daytime bondings and often needed fighter escort. It also required long, conventional runways. TAC knew from the start that new technology would quickly make the F-105 obsolete. Even as the 105 entered service, TAF was working on its replacement. The TFX fighter bomber would incorporate new materials, microcircuit technology, and innovative engineering concepts, including solid state electronics that would give the plane fantastic avionics capabilities, and most exciting of all, a variable swing wing that would greatly enhance the heavy plane's maneuverability. At the same time, the US Navy was developing its own brand new high tech aircraft for the fleet defense mission to succeed the F-4 Phantom. Although the F-4 was eventually used by both services, historically, the Navy and the Air Force developed their aircraft separately. But in 1961, newly appointed Secretary of Defense Robert McNamara announced it was time for a change. McNamara, the former vice president of the Ford Motor Company, arrived at the Pentagon determined to dispose of bureaucratic duplication and waste. Natanara insisted on a policy of standardization. He told the service chiefs that he wanted one basic aircraft design, suitable for use by both the Air Force and the Navy. In January of 1962, after several competitions, the Pentagon reduced the field to two possible alternatives. Boeing's 818 model, while favored by both services, did not have enough shared design elements. The other design was a joint venture from General Dynamics and the Grumman Corporation. This design offered a very high level of common parts for both services. The only major components to differ were landing gears, the wing length, and the nose. These are mock-ups of the two different nose design. McNamara was impressed. In November of 1962, an order was placed for 18 Air Force and 5 Navy planes. The aircraft was now designated the F-111. The planes were built at the Fort Worth plant of General Dynamics Comberg Division. The first pre-production model was officially rolled out 16 days ahead of schedule. 
25 months after the contract was signed, a first F-111, an Air Force A model, took to the air. The twin-seat F-111's unique features included a crew capsule that could be jettisoned as a complete unit clear of the main fuselage by the use of rockets. Ejection could be accomplished at any speed, at any altitude, or even below water. After it had landed or surfaced, the capsule could act as a survival shelter. The F-111 was also the first aircraft to go into full production utilizing after-burning turbofan engines. The TF-30 engine was economical. The afterburners were available for quick takeoff and extra speed. Still more range was built into the general dynamics design by utilizing every possible area available for fuel store. Even without external wing tanks, the plane had a range of over 2,500 nautical miles. With in-flight refueling or external fuel tanks, the F-111 could go anywhere, anytime. When no external fuel was carried, all of the wing points were free to lift an enormous array of weapon. And of course, the plane could carry ordnance in its internal bomb bay. F-111s can carry almost any weapon in the Air Force arsenal, from the M-61 Vulcan cannon to a free-falling nuclear bomb. The F-111 can draw the coil as an electronic countermeasure, and flares can be discharged to confuse heat-seeking missiles. One of the original requirements of the TFX project was that the design should allow for landing on short makeshift runways. General Dynamics met the challenge by inventing high flotation variable terrain landing gear. Another important F-111 feature that was brand new was terrain following radar. This system allows pilots to select an operating height above ground of as little as 200 feet. When the control is set, the aircraft can fly at over 600 miles an hour by its forward terrain scanning radar, adjusting its height automatically. A manual mode allows pilots to use the radar gathered information we produced on a cockpit instrument display. Thus, it is possible for the F-111 to fly at night in all weather and still remain low enough to avoid radar detection. The reason why I love flying the F-111 is because of the uh, ground attack mode that it does. Uh, it flies low level at high speeds, uh, any weather, day or night. Uh, it has the capability in the systems to do that anywhere from 200 feet to 1,000 feet. I do not necessarily have to be flying a jet at that time because of the automatic systems. Uh, I'm enclosed in a capsule that uh, protects me from the environment 
uh, in case we have to uh, leave the aircraft or eject, and that's a, an advantage that I like. The F-111 requires uh, more systems knowledge than most because the mission is longer so that if something does go wrong, it takes more time to recover the airplane because we're at a greater distance. And it takes someone who is it stays on top of it, as you can imagine, operating two, three, four hundred feet above the ground in a snowstorm at night going through the mountains. Uh, you have to be ready for just about any eventuality. The F-111 was the first production aircraft in aviation history to employ variable swing wings. But the story of the swing wing really goes back to the Second World War. Messerschmitt had produced several swing wing designs and actually built the V-1101. But it never flew. Much of this design was used in the American Bell X-5, built after the war. This model flew successfully, as did the Grunin Jaguar, although neither plane was to help. For high-speed flight, the F-111's wing could be swept back to form a delta configuration. An intermediate position was often used for economical mid-range flight. A full forward position was available for takeoff, landing, and low-speed flying. The plane could literally be redesigned in flight to suit the role it had to perform. Within the surface of the wing, flaps, slats, and fuel, together with their operating mechanisms, had to work side by side. To enable the forward slats to function, General Dynamics built a blob that also acted as an airfoil. The development of the Air Force F-111 gate model continued through the early 60s, and good progress was made as the new technology was put through its chasing. Dynamics and the Air Force were both pleased with the progress of their groundbreaking state-of-the-art aircraft. But Grumman, which was developing the Navy's F-111V model, had less success with its prototypes, but maybe was not happy with its new plane. The Secretary of Defense McNamara's commitment to standardization, the Navy had little choice but to accept the B version the F-111 prototypes were just too heavy for successful carrier use. Two expensive weight reduction programs failed to reduce the B model's weight. Worse, the modification process had radically reduced standardization. The F-111B model was a beautiful aircraft, but it never saw service. In July of 1968, the Navy canceled the F-111V program. Instead, it went ahead with its new dedicated fleet defense fighter, Grumman's F-14 Tomcat. But the F-111A continued testing. The Air Force's Harvest Reaper program was launched to bring the F-111 to combat readiness. 
by early 1968, after eight months of testing, it was decided that the Hep 111 should be tried out in actual combat conditions in Vietnam. The F-111A flew out of the Royal Thai Air Force Base at Tok Lee. The combat testing and evaluation program was called Combat Lancer. A Thai base caught the new planes within striking distance of North Vietnam. Unfortunately, the results were not all good. Within two weeks, two F-111s were lost without a trace. Less than a month later, another 111 went down. But this time, the crew ejected, and the wreckage was found and examined. The losses caused bad publicity back home, and were wrongly attributed in some news reports to ground fire. After 50 missions have been flown, Operation Combat Lancer ending. The three remaining F-111s return to Nellis for more testing. Afterwards, engineers discovered that the losses in Vietnam were caused by a failure in the plane's massive horizontal stabilizer. Then, in December of 1969, a Mellus based F-111 lost a wing. All F-111s were grounded. The entire program was placed under intense scrutiny. These were hard times for General Dynamics. For the extents of developing the twin designs, considerable cost overruns, and the losses in Vietnam, had caused the Mu Viger bomber to suffer at the hands of the press and political opponents alike. General Dynamics' defense was that the F-111 was a technological trailblazer that incorporated so many new systems that major problems would almost certainly be incurred. Both the Air Force and General Dynamics realized that despite the development problems, the F-111 was a winner, so they began improving the design. Despite the F-111's long evolution, very few external changes are noticeable. One minor one, the deletion of the moving air intake cowl and its replacement by the demand-activated inlet door, distinguishes the early A version from other models. By the time the modification program was completed, the F-111 had become a near-perfect plane. The F-111 was also adopted by the Strategic Air Command, which needed a replacement for its older B-52s and B-58 Hustlers. SAC's new strategic bomber was dubbed the FB-111. The SAC version had a longer wing and a strengthened landing gear, but otherwise was similar to its cousins in the Tactical Air Command. It is still probably one of the premier bombing planes in the world, bar none. I mean, there's not many people in the world that can bomb as well as we can, that can go as far as we can, and there is no one in the world that can go as fast as we can near the ground. And we, we cannot run F-16s and F-15s. 
I think everybody's had a scary moment at one time or, or another in the aircraft. Uh, the one I had that I remember occurred in uh, Turkey when I was training low level in there and we were uh, had a simulated attack by an F-4. Uh, we were low to the ground, we made a uh, hard turn into the F-4 and I had some uh, computers uh, go out on which caused the aircraft to start wavering in the yaw axis. Uh, 200 feet or so and uh, low to the ground and the jet decides to go down, it's not a fun feeling. In 1972, four years after its first test in combat, the F-111 returned to Vietnam as part of Operation Linebacker. And within 33 hours of leaving home at Mellis Air Force Base, planes were striking targets in Hanoi. Flying alone or in pairs, the planes of TAC's 474th Fighter Wing notched up 4,000 successful sorties in six months. Altitude hold and heading now, and engage the autopilot. Working good. Okay, we're coming up on our entry point at about five miles. We'll be turning right to a heading of 101. Okay, coming right here. I go out back and fly pass on the radar altimeter. Get the left channel and TF, and we'll put the right channel over to the situation. Okay. Ready to start on down deck? Okay, auto TF. Start down. Okay, I'm picking up the ground return to Yeah, Okay, attitude indicator. Let's go. Coming on down the east coast, ground returns coming in, and they right off never clicked in at 5,000. Lodge, we should level up about 500. Taking down to 1,000 here now, coming up 700, 600. And it's leveling off real fine, 550. Okay, that's good. I've got a ridge coming up at the five miles on the scope, and it's dead again. I'm on the 515. Okay. Looks like it's about three miles on my east scope now. Right. Okay, we should be passing about 10 seconds. Okay, I'm going to target, and we're in target, and I'm picking up, uh, picking up returns. It looks good. Crosshairs are falling good. Got the gun. In the whole operation, only six aircraft were lost, giving the F-111 the highest survival ratio of any combat aircraft in the theater. The F-111 returned from Vietnam with its reputation dramatically enhanced, and criticism of the plane became muted. Later support for the wisdom of the swing-wing bomber concept came from the Soviet Union, their Su-24 Flimser was patterned virtually bolt for bolt on TAC Spider Bomber. Two major modifications had dramatically increased the F-111's potential. One was devised by Grumman, the company that designed the Navy's F-111 model. Grumman's EF-111 Raven project found yet another use for this versatile airframe. The Raven project takes early model F-111s, strips them down to basic components, then completely rebuilds them as electronic countermeasures platforms. In the Raven, a second crewman there is an electronics weapons operator who uses sophisticated equipment to disrupt enemy radar. This provides a curtain for other attacking aircraft. The 
A Ravum can be used in three different ways. First, in a standoff jamming role, providing protection for other aircraft from a distance. Second, as close air support, going in at low level to give ground attack aircraft electronic cover. And finally, the Raven can fly with an attacking force deep into hostile airspace, jamming enemy radar as it goes. This system was used extensively in the Persian Gulf. Another major modification fitted to new F-111s is FAVTATH, a self-contained standoff weapons delivery system. FAVTARC uses an infrared TV camera coupled to a laser rangefinder designator to place guided bombs or missiles on target. PAVTAC components are fitted throughout the aircraft, but its major component is the PAVTAC FOG, which is fitted on a rotating cradle in the bomb bay. The pod is retracted into the bay when not in use. The PAVTAC pod is equipped with electro-optical sensors, infrared TV camera, and laser. Its movable pod head provides complete coverage for the aircraft. This is an actual AGM Maverick missile launch. Missile crosshairs are placed on the target by the weapon systems operated. The missile is now locked on target. The difficulties of flying the uh, F-111 are primarily uh, in the night regime or in the, in the bad weather. And that's where we, we're really uh, kind of a king of the hill in terms of uh, abilities in the world. Uh, the 111 was designed to operate at night in bad weather at very low altitudes. And uh, coupled with that, my job is to uh, look in a radar set and to uh, constantly determine our position and make sure that we're uh, going exactly where we want to and that our... Uh, navigation and bombing system is really accurate and that enables us to uh, deliver the weapons to drop the bombs on target so it's a very difficult part of my job to constantly be evaluating the airplane's position how good the navigation system is the objective of of the uh, strike was to uh, take some airplanes that could go a long ways carry a lot of a lot of bombs and could precisely hit targets in, in any kind of weather and take off and refuel and, and get there in any kind of weather and uh, hit targets that were very close to areas where you, you just wouldn't want to put bombs. So that was our mission. And as a wing, we all pitched in and, and uh, contributed. April 14th, 1986. F-111s of the 48th Tactical Fighter Wing leave RAF Lakenheath as part of the American strike mission against Libya. In response to a wave of Libyan-sponsored terrorist acts, the United States will strike five targets. Colonel Paul Fazakerly, a member of the 48th Fighter Wing, explains. The Navy's very capable of doing this kind of a mission, and they could drive carriers up there, and that's why we, we buy aircraft carriers, project power and, and drop bombs. But in this particular case, we had... Uh, five targets that we wanted to take out pretty much simultaneously. The, the Benita and Benghazi were the airfields to the east of, of the uh, Gulf of Sidra. 
And then we had three targets in the Tripoli area, the downtown headquarters complex, the swimming pool, which is an underwater demolition team uh, headquarters in a, in a um, frogman type uh, training center, as well as the third target, which was their airfield that they used to use their IL-76 transport aircraft to, to transport the, uh, their, their terrorist activities or to use to support the terrorist activities. So with five targets and, and the amount of defenses that were right around the Tripoli airport uh, and the, the town itself, it, it became an atmosphere where using the A6 off of a carrier, it's a little bit slower, it flies a little bit higher, it doesn't, doesn't have quite the capability to hit the targets as well as the F-111. It was decided at, at, the, at the 11th hour that it would be better if this would be a joint mission since we had practiced that contingency option. And so they decided, to, the National Command Authority decided to go ahead with that plan as a joint option and, and the 111 would be, be best suited for going into the area that was the, the most heavily defended and it could survive much better than and hit the targets with, with minimum collateral damage where the A6 would have, a, I think, a problem in that area uh, without an enormous amount of, of support. So the Air Force picked up the western targets, which were in downtown Tripoli area, and the Navy picked up the two airfields to the east. And it worked very good because we had trained with the Navy. We had a Navy liaison officer in the squadron, and everyone was comfortable with uh, the geographical separation of, of the two services and yet working together, sharing a lot of mutual support. In the 48th wing at Lake and Heath, uh, we took off from home and flew over 14 hours. It was just about 14 hours and 10 minutes was the longest mission. And refueled uh, three or four times, maybe even as much as five, because we wanted to, to optimize our refueling on the way down to be as close to uh, full tanks just prior to drop off in, down in, uh, in, in the Ita Italian area. There was no problem staying awake and being alive and and on the on the way down, as far as the crews commented, we had a, a little bit of problems with airplanes because the F-111 is is typically uh, a two and a half hour mission airplane. Uh, when you fly it for five six hours and then go hit a target, uh, you know who knows what's going to be left of it. You know, so even though we had tracked the airplane's maintenance capability, it was really gutsy to to take an old airplane like that that far and then expect it to perform. So of the 24 airplanes that we had started with, we took 18 down there, and then of the 18, we had actually 11 go into the target area. So we did have some, some maintenance problems, and we, we fully expected to with uh, taking an older airplane that far. And we had very, very strict rules of engagement because we didn't want to throw bombs off into the middle of the town. What you like to see is every single airplane hit every single target uh, with perfect footage of the film. Well, that just doesn't happen. Uh, so we had a lot of folks that um, that had to pull off to avoid uh, collateral damage. We had people with airplane problems. And a lot of folks have said, well, you, the airplane just didn't uh, hold up and there was problems and there was uh, it didn't do the mission as, as well as uh, expected. Well. The mission was to have visible damage on three targets. You just saw very, very vivid visible damage on two, and, and there was another tape of the third, which shows uh, the swimming pool with the water draining out of it. That was the, the mission, and that's all that counts, is if you can show that you have destroyed or had visible damage on those three targets that were tied to the terrorism activities. and. With those tapes, it's obvious that the mission was accomplished, and, and that's the overall uh, good part, is that it was accomplished, it was accomplished by the F-111, an old aircraft, the aircraft is still accomplishing those type of missions. Robert McNamara's dream of a fighter-bomber for both Air Force and Navy use never came true. But the plane he approved has, over the years, become the finest tactical and strategic bombing aircraft of its kind. 